that you will move among us and that you will reveal to us some fresh insight into the magnitude of your grace, the extent of your love, and the fullness of your presence. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. And for this sermon, I, I have to say that I thought that the word that Jesus used in this beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, actually restricted itself to people who are mourning the loss of a loved one, friend or whoever. The bereavement process, if you like, of that we all have to face from time to time. And, and I thought that was what Jesus was saying. Blessed are they. Um, but I actually found out as I studied, as I looked at various commentaries, because that's what you do, that there's two other things at least that came to mind. One was that the word mourn that Jesus uses here covers things other than bereavement. And also the second thing is somewhat uh, more of a surprise than that to me was the fact that <clears throat> the word blessed that Jesus uses, not only in this beatitude, but in all of them, the word blessed actually means happy. Be happy. If you're mourning, huh? hang on, how come? If that's the case, you might think it would be more appropriate and understandable if, if Jesus had said, happy are those who have uh, been joyful and merry and, and, and things are going perfectly well for them. He doesn't. His choice of words here is, is to people who are sad. You know, something's gone wrong. They're mourning somebody. Happy are those who mourn? Didn't ring terribly well off my tongue when I first read it. But when I looked at it in more depth to what Jesus was getting at, it became clearer. Because in this passage, as well as referring to people who are suffering and mourning and grieving the loss of a loved one, and that's perfectly normal and proper, and God gave us emotions, and we need to express them. If we don't, we can be in trouble. It also meant being sensitive to, sensitive to, and preaching blessings on those who mourn for other things such as their deep regret and sadness because of their own sin. Or maybe a real concern for the sorrowful state of the world at large, maybe for other people. And, and when in, in a truly heartfelt way, we look with compassion on anyone who as yet hasn't given their life to Christ. As Christians, we should be mourning that. I was talking to Taylor. I don't want to embarrass you, Taylor, because I asked you specifically this morning if you were just explaining me again how you came to Holly Lodge. Taylor came. She'll tell you her story. I'm not going to say it. She can tell it. Please ask her. Lovely story. But, you know, when you look at it, and Shane said a number of weeks ago now that he was looking at the analysis of Holly Lodge and how it progressed over the years and, and, and saying, well, how many people have actually come to the Lord through the work of the church here as distinct from coming into the church from elsewhere as Christians. And it's a challenge to us. And we should be mournful because people don't respond, don't give their lives to Christ, don't join in membership or whatever. Why? Because God said through this, tell you what, when you do those things, when you are really, truly and sincerely sorry for a previous life, really compassionate about what, what, what you know you've got to do, I will bless you. I will make you happy. That's what he's saying. And at an individual level, mourning is a personal grief over a personal sin, but also at, an, at, a, at a broader spectrum, we can be unhappy and we can be sad because of the spectrum of sin right across the world. Things we can't control as individuals, but they're there. And we weep inside the lack of integrity, the injustice in the world, the cruelty, the selfishness, all those kinds of things, society things. Shane's email to us this last week points out that we need to discern and empathize. Let's not sympathize, empathize, but put yourself in their shoes. Empathize with the brokenhearted. Not just 
those who are suffering because of someone who's died and they're really struggling with that. And they should. Why not? But also give comfort to those in need, including those who are hurting inside for other reasons. Maybe, as I said, because they're angry with injustice or they're, they're sad because of their own self and what they know they wished wasn't true of them. There are many things all around us that people grieve over and life's full of regrets. Oh dear, the if onlys, if only I hadn't, or if only I had, if I hadn't said, done or whatever. And what Jesus is getting at in this beatitude is this, whenever we are genuinely sorry for anything that we might or might not have done, and we truly grieve over our failures, and we have contrite hearts and we genuinely seek his forgiveness and we long to put those things right, then that's this beatitude in a nutshell. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. They will be comforted, Matthew 5, 4. You see, this beatitude hits little points in our lives, not just in that of the passing of a loved one. And throughout Jesus' ministry, he saw firsthand, didn't he, about grief. I mean, what about that occasion when he went to Mary and Martha's house because Lazarus had died? Mary and Martha's brother, and, and they, they were stricken with grief. He was also a personal friend of Jesus. And what does the Bible say? It couldn't be clearer, friends. If you look at it, look at it. John eleven thirty five, 35, smallest word, verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. He wept. And, and what about Peter, that tough guy, that man's man, that lovable rascal of a disciple who, despite all his protests, that he would never let Jesus down, when did just that? Not once, not twice, three times he did it. And that would have hurt Jesus very, very badly, apart from Peter himself. And when Peter did that, he was truly sorry. Because in the moment of panic it was. He didn't plan to do that. He wasn't intending to betray our Lord. He did it because he was frightened. How often is that true of us? We do things spur of a moment. And when we look back, we think, oh my God, why did I do that? He wept. He was really sorry as a consequence. Three times, Jesus had to say, do you really love me? Do you really love me? You know, the outcome to Peter's feelings of shame and remorse are very evident in Peter's replies to those questions. Lord, you know, you know that I love you. Hang on. <laughs> How would Jesus know that Peter loved him if he'd done just that? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus looked over and above that, and he forgave that, because he knew Peter was really mournful about what he'd done. See the point? Those three short responses by Jesus, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, he said. Say it all. Peter knew at that point he had been forgiven, and the joy and happiness he expressed after that Shameful though he must have felt for what he'd done, it speaks for itself. The prophet Isaiah, which uh, Sue read for us, uh, it's a different version, it's the easy English version. You, perhaps some of you aren't familiar with that, but I thought it expressed this very well. Isaiah writes, he, this is the prophet, he sent me to make people happy again. They will not weep, that's Isaiah 61, 2, 3. And John, the author of the book of Revelation, later in, who was inspired to write, Nobody will cry. Everything has, bad has gone. God will wipe away all tears. These words, I love this. These words are true. Everyone can believe them. Now, if that's not a happy outcome, I don't know what is. I really don't. You know, the world, uh, D.A. Carson, who wrote uh, a, a commentary on the Sermon of the Mount, uses a lovely phrase, and, and I picked it up. I'm going to give it, I'm going to attribute it to him. This is not mine. He said, the world in which we live loves to laugh. TV, game shows, I'm not going to get my Mr. Happy out again. You know, this kind of thing. 
TV game shows are built around the concept of creating joy and jollity. This is Carson, not me. In general, people who are always cheerful and like to have a good time and enjoy life are more likely to be popular and good to have around us than people who are like the proverbial wet blanket. You know the sort? People who seem to wear permanently long faces. Have you heard that story? I'm sure you have, of that little girl who was walking along one day in the field. And after looking at the horse, she said, that horse must be a Christian. It's got such a long face. And that can be so true, can't it? I don't want to um, upset anybody here at all. Please, that's not my, but it's an illustration. When we stood out the front here, preaching or singing or whatever it is, it's always been my hope and desire that people will look at us and think, what miserable looking bundle they are. And it can be so easy. You ask my wife, Hillary, uh, about me when I'm playing the piano in the church. She says, you know, I've looked miserable, you know. But the problem is I'm concentrating to make sure I pay the right notes and that it doesn't always happen. But, you know, we, we need to be cheerful, lift it. And it's not always easy. And we don't always consciously look miserable, but sometimes we do. And of course, it's only right and proper to feel sorrow and grief as we mourn the loss of a loved one. As I said earlier in the service, God gave those emotions to us to express. Blessed are those that mourn means they shall be happy. Why? How, for goodness sake? Well, as we saw in John's uh, words in, in his inspired words in Revelation, it's because at the end of the day, there's a promise of eternity and eternal life to those who've given their hearts to the Lord. We're never beyond God's loving, forgiving care. But we need to acknowledge our failings. We need to recognize when we do that, though, we can once again experience happiness. The good news is we can, in fact, rely on God's comfort. There's a way out. The way out. So we can lift our heads once again. And the Bible assures us that there's no comfort or joy that can compare with what God can bring to those who mourn their errors. I don't know about you, but I, I know this for me, and I speak against myself here um, it's all very well standing up here, and Shane and other preachers in the congregation know exactly the same thing. You can stand up here, but you're no know, different to people out there. If God's given you something to say, fine. The service I went to yesterday, uh, the minister who was, was, was preaching, giving a charge to the new minister of that church, uh, he actually talked about how we toil. And he talked about that. In sermon preparation, if you're toiling over a sermon, it may be it's the wrong thing anyway. God, God, does, God doesn't want you to say that. And I've had the same experience as he did. I shared it with him afterwards that there have been times when I pour over things for, for hours, days sometimes, to get a service structure right or a sermon. And the morning you wake up, that's not right. I know God doesn't want me to say that. And you end up doing something totally different and it falls off the pen. There's no toiling in that. And that's the difficulty. And so often, you know, we, we toil and we struggle. And it's usually because we, we're going our way. We're saying it our way. We're doing it our thing. And God says, no, no, I want to do something different in, in your life. I want, you to, I want you to actually be big enough to go to that person if you need to and say, I'm sorry. Or go to God and say, I shouldn't, should I? That's the challenge. Because when we do, the relief, I, I, I'm quite sure, I don't want to make any accusations, I'm quite sure all of us at some stage in our life will have had that moment when we've actually gone to our wife, our husband, our child, our parent, a friend, and said, I, I, I'm sorry. And don't you feel better? Don't you feel better? Of course you do. And relationships can be put right again. And, and, and God is saying, you know, you can experience true happiness when you're truly aware of what I want in your life and you comply with that. There is a way up again. And there's no doubt nothing can compare with the 
feeling of happiness and love that God gives us in those moments when we submit to what he wants. We need to be assured of that. But would you notice as we, as we come to the end, there's a specific word here I want to focus on. The, the Beatitude doesn't say we might be comforted. It says we will. Positive. That's why, although we might think there are some things from which we don't think there's any escape, we can't. That's too, we've done, I've done it now. That's it. No, not with God. No matter what it is, he'll lift you again. He picks up, as the Bible tells us, the brokenhearted. Think of that disciple Peter I spoke of a moment or two ago. He really did get it horribly wrong, didn't he? He really did. Uh, and it was a real low point in his life. You think of it, what he'd done. And the next thing he's looking around and there's Jesus hanging on the cross. And Peter had said the magic words. Oh, nothing to do with me. Nothing to do with me. No, I don't know the man. He walked away when Jesus needed his support. The prophet Isaiah said, when we at our lowest, the spirit of the sovereign Lord binds up the brokenhearted. He releases us from darkness. So why are we surprised when he said, blessed, that is happy, are those who mourn? It makes sense, coming back to God. And when we look at the depth of the world's suffering, and see the extent of sin all around us. It, it breaks our hearts, doesn't it? Let alone God's heart. It breaks our hearts. And, and whether it's for yourself or for someone else, you want to hold on to these words. But, but when we do, and, and, and we know when we feel low, because of whatever the reason, and look up a kind of a collective now mourning in the senses I've described in two senses. One is the physical elements of mourning because of bereavement. And the other is the real sincere regret for our lives. And we want it put right. When we, when we come to Christ at that point, he forgives, forgets as though it hadn't happened and lifts us. In the synagogue at Nazareth, Jesus actually read that same passage himself. And he actually said something after that, which is really lovely. He said, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. That's in Luke 4, 17. He was actually saying, I am that Messiah who Isaiah prophesied about. This is the fruition, is the culmination, the, the com coming together of God's word. This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. I, Jesus, am the one he's talking about. And God sent me to bind up the brokenhearted which is what this is about. Blessed are those who mourn. And this is true. Why? How? Because Jesus died on that cross and rose again and paid the price for our sin. Blessed are those who mourn. They'll be happy, but we first have to do our bit. Nobody can imagine what eternity is like, can they? But it's enough to know that eternity with God will be more wonderful than we could ever imagine a place where our worst sins will be wiped away and our unhappiness is completely dealt with and we're lifted in God's presence. But there's more. We have the promise that we will once again be with loved ones who have gone before us. God promises a wonderful blessing in this particular beatitude. And as Jesus says, we can be sure of that. We can be sure of God's love when we turn to him because he will comfort us, because he knows us. And he knows what we want, even more than we do. Friends, no wonder he said, blessed are those who are happy, are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And as Revelation says, these words are true. Everyone can believe them. We're going to sing as our closing song, uh, one of my favourites. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death for me. And you know what? I keep getting it wrong again and again and again. But you keep coming back 
and you lift and you bless. I'm in that place once again. As we sing this song, let's sing it as a prayer. Let's sing it as a confession if we need to. But let's know God's presence as we do so. Let's stand and sing. Thank you.